This video has been supported by Debson. Hey folks, another day, another portable power station. On the data sheet, this one covers all the basics. A high capacity, long lasting lithium iron phosphate battery. A DC to DC capable MPPT tracker for direct charging from low or high voltage solar panels or other DC sources like 12 or 24 volt vehicle alternators. It's the first one I'm seeing that has a high power mains charger built right in. So when traveling with it, you don't have to carry around another separate device for charging. Still, it manages to be very compact and lightweight. The manufacturer has sent over a DBS2300 sample for me to test, as well as a few accessories that are included by default, such as an MC4 to XT60 solar charge cable, an XT60 to cigarette lighter charge cable, and a massive power cord for 1.8 kilowatt grid charging. This unit is intended for USA 110 volt in and output. So in a few scenes you might see me use this transformer to adapt to European voltages. That's not included and you won't need it if you get the correct power station for your region. One optional item that has to be purchased separately is a huge foldable solar panel for outdoor charging. If the sun treats us kindly, we'll give that a try in a moment. On its left side, the power station has two special connectors for extension battery packs. These let you connect separately sold batteries to extend the power station's capacity. And you love to see it, they expose the internal battery voltage permanently without any prior digital handshake. The pins are 4mm in diameter too, and that opens up a few opportunities for wonderfully ill-conceived shenanigans. Such as powering an e-bike motor from the internal 48V battery directly, or expanding a larger stationary power storage system with this box, while its mobile capabilities are not needed. But careful, the output voltage range makes me believe that the DBS2300 contains only 14 cells in series, so it wouldn't be directly compatible with a 16S system like my SOK server rack batteries. We do however have the same wonderful lithium iron phosphate battery chemistry in here, which means that the cells will last for a very very long time, i.e. retain at least 80% of their original capacity after 3500 cycles. The front of the unit has a blindingly bright LED light source that it can power for 4 days straight or use to shift out a Morse code. That's either an SOS signal or an encoded joke about people who don't understand Morse code. We may never know. With two 2.4 Ampere USB Type A ports and a quick charge capable one, as well as one 100 Watt and two 27 Watt USB C power delivery capable ports. The DBS2300 is fairly well equipped in the USB department. None of these can be used to charge the power station itself, however. A smartphone app is currently being prepared. That's what that Wi-Fi reset button is for. On the right, we've got some 12 volt DC outputs, two barrel jacks, a cigarette lighter, and an Anderson connector, carrying up to 30 ampere for fixed wiring in vehicles. I inquired about the USB type B connector, hoping that it might be usable to read some charge and discharge statistics over something like a serial port. That would be awesome for data logging and automation, and I've never seen it in any portable power station before. But the short answer was nope, at least not yet. And finally, around the corner, we've got our five outlets, which can deliver up to 2.2 kilowatt of pure sine 120 volt AC power. In total, continuous or 4 kilowatt of short term surge. And just above are the charge inputs, an XT60 for the various DC sources and an IEC inlet for grid charging, either on full blast 1.8 kilowatt or with the customized switch set to low, you can apparently choose the charge speed yourself in the app based on what your source has available. At 24 kilogram at roughly 30 liters of volume, this product is lightweight and compact for what it is i.e. a huge battery, a high power inverter and a lot of charge circuitry. But generally speaking it's quite a chonker. I wouldn't want to put it in a backpack and take it with me while hiking. The promotional material speaks of an aircraft grade aluminium alloy and a honeycomb structure design. For impact resistance, I can see none of that from the outside. It's all plastic here. The bottom at least is amazingly spank resistant. The sides however could become a little bit more substantial in the final production. With a built-in mains inlet as opposed to an external low voltage charger, the DBS2300 is in a unique position to offer a real bypass mode, 
which is wonderful for a UPS application where we just want to supply power normally to an important consumer without permanently involving and wearing out the battery. It only has to step in when the primary power supply fails. I can't tell for sure if it really has this function implemented properly or if it's just pretending until I take it apart. But the fact that the light bulb seems to dim briefly when I enable the AC input makes me believe that it's real. That's actually amazing, not even the fancy Blue Eddy AC200 Max has this feature. In this UPS mode the manual specifies a 15 millisecond switch over time. That's not world class, super high reliability data center UPS performance. But it's enough to keep alive my PC under light load and several pieces of electronic test equipment. And that is good enough for me. A foldable solar panel like this is a great addition to every portable power station. It doesn't matter if it's just going to sit in a corner for all eternity. Even just thinking about it is a great source of that adventurous outdoor survivalist feeling that we keyboard warriors crave. This is a 200 watt peak generator, meaning that it's going to put out 160 to 170 watt under good conditions in Germany. At that rate and with a few inefficiencies in the equation, you'd have to charge for a little more than half an hour to boil a liter of water. Acceptable when out camping. But these foldable thingies are often overpriced. A fixed waterproof thin film panel with a higher peak power can often be had for about 100 bucks. So maybe look into a comparison before committing to this option. Teardown ability is tainted by these decorative plastic brackets that just hook into the remaining enclosure parts. But as always I can understand that catering to our odd tastes is not necessarily a manufacturer's first priority. Here's our honeycomb infill pattern which makes this yeah, a pretty durable plastic part. Somehow I had expected aircraft grade aluminium alloy honeycombs. This is an acceptable trade off though. At a first glance the internal construction looks nice. There are no vibration susceptible top heavy SIP modules strewn about. The overwhelming majority of cables are good quality silicone ones. There is an abundance of toroid filters on the high current cables. Even on the ones connecting the inverter to the battery. Not sure if all of these are worth having but hey better too many than too few. There is a bit of warmth in here even though the mains inverter has been powered off for hours. And sure enough, I've heard the cooling fans spin up every 30 minutes or so. Simply in standby with all the outputs powered off. Not sure why, but something in here must have a few watts of standby power consumption. This board on the top is a double DC to DC converter. Accepting the 46 volt battery voltage and putting out 12 and 24 volt for all the DC consumers like USB, cigarette lighter and cooling fans. The box below that seems to be an outsourced AC in AC out module. On one hand that makes me expect a good quality mature UPS like system in there. On the other hand I had hoped that the Dabson DBS2300 would be the one power station to do everything right while still remaining somewhat affordable. But this is beginning to look pretty pricey now. The BMS board uses a Nuvoton ARM Cortex M0 32 bit microcontroller. Probably for no more than fuel gauging and looking over the shoulder of the actual BMS IC and communicating its status to the front panel and display assembly. Maybe also controlling charge and discharge switches based on user inputs and presence of expansion battery packs. This time the expansion pack digital pins are ugly but connected to the BMS board at least. So they could do their own power metering and transmit data to the central fuel gauge. Did you see that? I think we've got prismatic cells in here. They leave less empty space between them and they need a lower percentage of metal casings per watt hour. That must be how this product manages to be more compact and lightweight than the competition. The SH367309 BMS chip claims to have low temperature charge prevention in its datasheet. But as we've seen in the past that is often not configured correctly. Now I'm not too keen on tearing apart the whole battery assembly just to excavate one of the three temperature sensors. So I'm simply going to simulate a 10 kilo ohm NTC thermistor with a potentiometer. And sure enough at around 40 kilo ohm which corresponds to minus 5 celsius the BMS stops accepting charge. So the precious lithium iron phosphate in here is safe even at freezing temperatures. And it is especially safe because of this frankly impressive aluminium mounting frame. 
Only I'm not so sure about these hose clamps. What role do they play in here? Well, this is probably still a beta unit. Manual labor such as fitting and tensioning hose clamps is inefficient and therefore undesirable in mass production. So it's unlikely that this will make it into the retail version. It looks like the front panel PCB, responsible for Wi-Fi, the power LED, USB power, and the LCD, is prepared for a few variants. My guess would be that this is an attempt at gaining some independence to supply chain disruptions in certain components. Smart if so, since there is a lot of unoccupied part area anyway. So this central box has been outsourced to Xi'an Topology Electric Power Technology Co. Limited, And honestly, I'm completely okay with that. The Deps and engineering team has done a good job in their debut product. The multi-directional power conversion and routing in one of these power stations, however, is on another difficulty level entirely. I imagine it's very hard to get this functional, energy efficient, EMC compliant, compact, economic, safe, reliable and mass producible in 2022 no less. This module does all of that and it comes from a larger experienced supplier. It accepts mains power input to charge the battery at a customizable rate. And with these blue 17 ampere relays it can obviously be configured to short the incoming mains power directly to the output bypassing everything while available. Somehow they even managed to squeeze the DC MPPT charger in here. For that input I can see no over voltage protection like a fuse and a MOV or a spark gap. Only the yellow electrolytic caps have a 100 volt rating so they will clamp eventually. I had hoped to find a jumper link or two in here to reconfigure the module to European 230 volt. But unfortunately no such luck. This is very specific for the North American continent. The manufacturer doesn't even list an international version on their website. A shame honestly, because I feel like that means there won't be an international DBS2300 anytime soon. Really cute module though. This is basically the whole functionality in the palm of my hand. It looks and feels great and I find it a lot more trustworthy than if it had been designed in-house by a young startup company. No offense, but I mean you can see the immense complexity in here for yourself. In conclusion, I have to admit I like it a lot. I came here expecting a low cost, low effort attempt at milking the power station trend. But what I found is a nice and well rounded package of features that rivals even Blue Eddy and EcoFlow. It is still a prototype so there might be changes in the final retail version. And I don't know yet what the Daps and DBS2300 is going to cost. I liked what I saw though, and if you did too, you can check out the link in the description below.